And okay, so good morning. We are with Representative Beth Bern Bernstein Bernstein. Stein. Berth Beth Bernstein. She is um, the incumbent for House District 78. Um, and we're going to be doing the Q&A. We did reach out to her challenger um, who did not respond to any contact. So we've got Beth on here for our Q&A. And Representative Bernstein, if you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and your platform, um, and then we'll dive right into the questions. Okay, certainly. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think it's these issues um, are really important. And so we need to have this dialogue. So it's excellent that um, y'all are doing this. And thank you for the opportunity of being here. So as you said, my name is Beth Bernstein. I represent House District 78, which is right here in Richland County. I um, ran for office in 2012 didn't ever think about um, serving in the political arena, but I just felt like things needed um, some change maybe, you know, I was just a lot was going on in 2012 for the state. So I decided to run for office and uh, didn't really know what it was gonna be like to serve and the issues that that would present. But I was born and raised right here in the district that I represent. And at the time, my, my two young daughters were even younger at the time. And I wanted them to be proud of this community and of the state. And at that time, there were we were in the headlines for everything bad it seemed like. So I ran for office and um, really focused on issues that affect our children and women's issues. And I even pull in the environment. But fundamentally, education is the, the basis for everything. If you can teach a child or if you um, understand the importance of being, um, you, you could throw a bunch of money at healthcare, but until you teach a person how to be healthier, it's not going to make a difference. And when I entered the legislature, I was surprised that we had not focused as much on education as we should. And it shouldn't all be, shouldn't always be about funding, but it, to me, what's really important is where you grow up, what zip code you're in should not affect the type of education that you receive, because we should all have that opportunity of having um, a education that we would be proud of. As far as issues and that platform that pertain to education, I'm going to brush through that. So because I know we'll probably expound on that and have a really nice dialogue here, I hope. Um, first and foremost, I think we need to increase our teacher salaries. I mean, it's abhorrent that we haven't done what we need to be doing to even be at the Southeast average, the national average. I think we should even exceed the national average. And I understand that teachers don't go into the profession because of a salary. However, we need to be able to have a salary that is competitive because we're not going to be able to recruit otherwise. And we also need to retain, um, be able to retain teachers. And, and that is linked to salary. Um, we also need to provide a classroom setting that is tenable. So we need to make sure that classroom size is not only benefits the, the teacher, but also I think it's a bit more beneficial for the student to be in a smaller class size. Um, and then just as a, we'll probably talk throughout our discussion, we need to have equity in how our fund our schools. Um, it should not depend upon the zip code that you live in. And, and, as far as schools, that and I have a platform with lots of issues, but as far as our schools and education, I think those would probably be the three most important to me personally. Great. Thank you. So we're just going to dive right into the questions. Um, the first one is, what is your opinion of the state of public education in South Carolina today? Okay, so uh, we have a long way to go. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know, we we've tried to make improvements, and 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 honestly, out of the 170 members of the General Assembly, I think we all go into it wanting to do the right thing. Um, we have great teachers in South Carolina. We need to be able to keep those teachers. And we need to be able to recruit, and that's what I kind of touched on in the 
in the first question. Um, we have dedicated teachers, but we're seeing that students that are entering college are not going into the profession of teaching. And we've got to change that. And, we, and, the, and we've got to incentivize people to go into the profession of teaching. I mean, you have it with nursing as well. You need to provide incentives so that students who enter college will go into that profession. And as far as teaching, we need to also further incentivize to go in our rural areas, which are the most vulnerable areas. But we really, I think that is linked to salary. So we need to make sure we're paying our teachers what they're worth. We um, need to be able to trust our teachers also to teach. So giving that autonomy, the, the crisis that we've been dealing with with COVID and the pandemic has really opened our eyes to a lot of issues that I think most clearly shows the disparity um, where some schools have broadband, others don't. That is for that's something that we need to address. Um, I would say probably one of the first things that we need to address. And hopefully, when we come back in September, we will be able to address um, that disparity. We also have such inequity in how we fund our schools, and I think that's very pressing. Uh, it's. Um, as far as um, the the gap in the funding, it's it's a touchy subject because where I live, Richland County District Two, I was I went to all of those schools. My five siblings and I all went to those schools. We are fortunate that we have that, and I don't want to take away from the success story that we see there, but we've got to figure out how we're going to make sure that if you live in Dillon County or if you live in Bamberg County, that you have the same opportunities. And that's going to be a theme that is recurrent. It's a difficult way to do it. There's been talk of a statewide kind of millage. I think Act 388 put a monkey wrench in all of this. Um, Richland District 2 is going, we're residential heavy. So Act 388 has impacted our um, district. Um, and so we need to be proactive. A lot of what I've learned of being in the legislature is we're more reactive instead of proactive. And we've got to be able to shift that mindset that we need to be able to forecast what an issue is going to be and plan accordingly. Otherwise, we are on the reactive side and this, that's not going to benefit anybody. So there are a lot of a lot of issues and a lot of ways we can improve. And sometimes I feel like we have to take baby steps, but we've taken baby steps for too long when it is it, when it deals with education and the issues surrounding that. And like I said, that is the basis of everything. If you can teach a child how to eat healthy, or if you can teach a child a, a trade, or if you can teach a child some, you know, that's only going to help us as a community. I always say you're only as strong as your weakest link and and we're not supporting our weakest link. Great. If, if re-elected, what would be the first step you would take to improve public education? Oh, there's so many steps. First would, <laughs> and hopefully- For the hopefully very we, first. <laughs> you know, when we come back in September, um, can you hear me okay? I just lost yeah. my ear pod. Okay. Yeah. So when we came back in when we were coming back in September, we're dealing with the budget. And um, hopefully, I think one of the first things that we need to look at is, you know, what recurring money we're going to have and make sure that our our salary and allocation towards our teachers and the benefits are still going to be there. Okay, so we've got to prioritize that. Um, we've got to make sure that the broadband is there. I mean, like I said, with COVID, we're all trying to navigate this new arena that we're in. I mean, look at how we're even being interviewed. You know, we're having this dialogue through Zoom, but we're seeing, hey, it's working and we're all dedicated to doing it because we see the importance. We also see the importance of having the 
face to face contact. And that's why um, you're seeing a lot of research being done in how we're going to implement in classroom weighing the health of of the child with the exposure to COVID as opposed as opposed to um, risking health and safety of you know the employees and what I'm trying to say is just it's, it's got to be a balance but we see that you have to have, be able to have that access to broadband I mean we we saw that 10,000 children were unaccounted for when we didn't have school in the spring so issues dealing with what we've seen from COVID. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. My computer's good. Are you there? Yes. So you're, she... Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're still good. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You there? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Beth, can you hear me? Oh dear. Oh. Can you hear me? Is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hence the need for broadband, right? <laughs> you can't hear. Um, can you hear me now? No? Let me do this.